One more question uh, which came online basically and that is uh, another common question we are facing in this country is existence of God because today uh, we look at uh, people on the street and we see that they are English and we think that they are Christian but Christians themselves they are going through real difficult time because uh, many of the Christians or so-called Christians they themselves are not believing in that. Now they are moving towards uh, no religion, atheism. And uh, so how can we convince them? As far as convincing an atheist who says that there is no God, the first thing I'll do is I will congratulate that atheist. I congratulate that atheist because he is thinking. Most of the other human beings, they are doing blind belief. Most of the Christians, the Christian because father is a Christian. He is a Hindu because father is Hindu. The person is a Jew because father is a Jew. Most of the Muslims are Muslims because their parents are Muslims. This particular atheist, he's thinking his parents may be religious or he may have heard about the concept of God, but he does not accept that this thing can be God. So he rejects God. The reason I congratulate that atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, the Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is proof to him, illa Allah, but Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. So half my job is done. For the other non-Muslims who believe in a false God, I first have to prove that the God they are worshipping is wrong. And then prove to them about the true one almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, half my job is done. In order to convince an atheist, most of the atheists, they have knowledge of science and they think science is ultimate. I ask the atheist that, if suppose an equipment is brought in front of you, who no one in the world has ever seen is brought in front of you, and the question is asked that who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment? The reply the atheist will give is the creator of that equipment. Some may say the inventor, some may say the manufacturer, some may say the producer. Whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar. Either the creator, the inventor, the manufacturer, the producer, it will be somewhat similar. Just keep this at the back of the mind. Then you ask him the question, how did our universe come into existence? And he will tell us that there was one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation of Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, and the earth on which we live. This they call as the Big Bang. Then we ask him, when did you come to know about this? He will tell us about 30 years back, about 40 years back. You tell him, this is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. That do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? And he will say, maybe it's a fluke. Don't argue with him. Ask him the next question. What is the shape of the earth? He will tell you, previously people thought it was flat. In 1577, when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the earth, he proved it was spherical. Quran says in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, Wal ardh baad azalika dahaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth egg-shaped. The Arabic word dahaha specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And we know the world is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole. It is geospherical in shape. And the egg of an ostrich too is geospherical in shape. Quran mentions the geospherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? He will tell, maybe your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was very intelligent. Don't argue with him. Ask him the next question. The light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? He will tell you, previously people thought the light of the moon was its own light. Now we have come to know it's a reflected light. Recently in science, 100 years back, 200 years back. Quran says 1400 years ago, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that the light of the moon is borrowed light. It is a reflection of light. So like that, there are more than thousand verses in the Quran which speak about science. Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C. -E it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. Quran speaks about biology, that everything is created from water. Quran speaks about botany, that the plants have got pairs, male and female, in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 53. The fruits are created in pairs, in Surah Ra, chapter 13, verse number 3. The Quran speaks about the water cycle, which Sir Bernard Palissy described in 1580. How does the water rise, form into clouds, the clouds move in the interior, and the rain falls, and the cycle is completed. It is given in several places in the Quran. 
in Surah Al Zumur chapter 39, verse number 21, in Surah Rum chapter number 30, verse number 24, in Surah Mu'minun chapter 23, verse number 18, in Surah Hijal chapter 15, verse 22, in Surah Rum chapter number 24, verse 43, in Surah Rum chapter 30, verse 48, in Surah Araf chapter 7, verse 57, in Surah Raj chapter 13, verse 17, in Surah Furqan chapter 25, verse 48 and 49, in Surah Fatir chapter 35, verse number 9, in Surah Yasin chapter 36, verse 34, in Surah Jasha chapter 45, verse number 5, in Surah Qaf chapter number 50, verse number 8 and 9, in Surah Mul chapter 6, 7, verse 30, in Surah Tariq chapter 86, verse number 11, you can keep on and on. Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? Quran speaks about medicine, about embryology. The only reply the person can give you is the creator, the manufacturer, the inventor. This creator, this manufacturer, this inventor we Muslims call as Allah, Almighty God. That is the reason today science is not eliminating God, it is eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. This is one of the ways you can convince. There are various other ways you can refer to my video cassette. Is the Quran God's word? We will take last caller of this program as we have only three, four minutes to go, inshallah. And uh, hello, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Yeah, uh, for, uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh -huh. uh, it's regarding idol worship. Uh, when we talk to a Hindu who believes in uh, idol worshiping, and we uh, try to convince them that Islam doesn't allow this. Uh, and their reply is that Muslims themselves face the Holy Kaaba to pray. And that's also equivalent to idol worship. How do we reply to such a question? Okay, Jazakumullah. We have only about two minutes. As far as the allegation that the Muslim worship the Kaaba, no Muslim ever worship the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla, the direction. We Muslims believe in congregation. If we have to offer salah, all the Muslims throughout the world, as Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 144, should face towards the Kaaba. Kaaba is the Qibla, it's the direction. Furthermore, if we analyze when the Muslims do the world map of geography, it was Al Idrusi, when he drew the world map, South Pole was on top, North Pole down, and Kaaba was in the center. Later on, the Western cartographers came, they put the North Pole top, South Pole down, yet Kaaba was in the center. So all the places throughout the world, people should face towards the Kaaba. And when we go for Umrah or for Hajj, the Muslims circumambulate around the Kaaba because it's a commandment of Almighty God. But the logical reason we can think is because every circle has got only one center to testify that there is one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the statement of Hazrat Umar radiallahu an, the second caliph of Islam, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, in the book of Hajj, chapter 56, Hadith number 675, Hazrat Umar, he said that this black stone, it can neither benefit me, it can neither cause me harm. I'm only kissing it because I've seen my prophet kiss it. This statement is sufficient to prove that we don't worship the Kaaba. And the last argument you can put forth is that during the time of the prophet, there were Sahabas who stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan. Which idol worshipper will ever stand on the idol he or she worships? This is sufficient proof to show that we Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. And to prove to the Hindus that idol worship is haram, you can give hundreds of quotations from the scriptures. Bhagavad Gita chapter number 7 verse number 20 says that all those whose intelligence has been thrown by material desires, they worship demigods. There are various quotations you can refer to my video cassette, similarities between Hinduism and Islam, which will prove to you that even according to Hinduism, idol worship is prohibited. Jazakumullah khair and uh, I apologize to all the callers who are waiting online that uh, for a while we will not be able to take your call. And um, inshallah, Dr. Zakir is here and he will be participating in Islamica program and you will be able to ask questions again uh, in that program, inshallah. And very quickly, um, the holy books, Torah, Zabur and Injil, in which languages they were revealed? Ah, the Torah, Zabur and Injil, According to scholars, the Old Testament and the New Testament, since it was in Hebrew, so it is illogical that though the Jews, and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was a Jew, he spoke but natural Hebrew, but we have the original manuscript in a different language. So that's one of the proofs that what they have, the original manuscript, is not in its original form. Mm -hmm. So the Hebrew Bible that we have today of the New Testament, it's a translation Right. That is the reason the Quran 
which is the last and final revelation. If there's something like the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Quran is the last testament. It was revealed in Arabic, it's maintained its pure form. That's what one of the staunchest critics of Islam, Sir William Muir, he said 200 years back, the book that has maintained purity only is the Quran for 12 centuries. He said that 200 years back. Jazakumullah khair. Respected viewers, it was our pleasure and personally myself, uh, honor for me to uh, host this program with my special guest today, Dr. Zakir Nayak. Until then, Allah Hafiz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran.